And this really happened. I was like, no, it's supposed to look like that. Uh, <laughs> oh, and it was amazing. You ever gone up to like the Stack Overflow for, I think it's called like, code code golfing? Code. But it's like you use regex and all these really condensed commands to write like a file in like three lines mm. to have it do something really cool. I have oh. done that. Sorry. I've done that with yes, bro, but I've done that with R. I've had some horrifying one liners. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, it was so great to see the feedback because some of those very things I tried doing in R. <laughs> <laughs> I've only I, heard stories. Yeah, I used to go Yeah, I, I still like, use it. Uh, it's like Lena. we were learning some things in class today that just make it so much easier because I wouldn't have to go to school. Oh, mostly C4. Huh? Huh. Yeah. Huh. My third grade girl in the lab I was in. One of the predecessors had really moved off a lot, so she had left a mark on that lab. Tell us about it. Maybe she had just made a phone. Oh, Janet told me that there nice. was all kinds of snow in Wisconsin. I was talking to myself. Night they're in the teens. Oh. They've been they've, they've been below zero several times. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Forty years I think it was that. Oh. I mean it's yeah. just like thirty six people right now, so we'll be able to against my <laughs> <laughs> They have to go there. That's right. Yeah, I know. My brother lives in LA. My parents are still there. Well, they hardly ever go out. It's like that they have to go from there to the US Embassy. They have to say they want to like Normally I wouldn't say that they have to drive somewhere, pick something up, and drive the Walks around the perimeter of the garage to get exercise. Oh, it's cool there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but because I have all the like all the things, I don't really know there was much more structure. I don't know how it is. It's the family house. This past year, so it feels kind of new. Year old comes a day old. It's like the. Constant. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was a big one. I think it was a was that's what they did here. I mean, I have to actually have to 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 have to
Oh, I see. Cheers. Oh, yes. Okay, that counts over. School came back and over my father's practice. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, so now we're not the word one Why? Yes. It's cheaper at UM. John Fong takes 20 minutes to edit. He takes two months. Just know what you're getting yourself into. What that you're about what? <coughs> oh no, that was the last one. I put boss to purposely obscure it. Because the guy who I'm here for is not my boss. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, but then someone reads it. I have no idea if he actually fun. You're the only one I've read it. Parents that view them. Alright, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a full house, which is awesome. Um, there's a sign-in sheet going around, as always. Please do just put your name on it. just helps us justify the pizza, and we always like our pizza. Um, so today's speaker is Sriram Chandrasekharan, and he is Assistant Professor in Biomedical Engineering, and he is going to talk to us today about Indigo. Thanks, Marcy, and thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a new computational approach that, uh, that we've done uh, for designing drug combinations. Uh, called Indigo. Let's see if can I use the keyboard? Yeah. So in general, my research uh, involves designing computational approaches for understanding antibiotic resistance. So we look at different aspects of this. Uh, we develop computational models to understand uh, pathogen metabolism. We also are trying to understand the interactions between uh, the immune system and the pathogens and try to use that to design uh, new therapies. And this part is going to be the focus of my talk today, which is developing new computational algorithms uh, for repurposing <coughs> existing drugs and using them in combinations to design to design our combination therapy. <coughs> so uh, I just want to give a brief background of why we are, we are doing this. Uh, so as you know that antibiotic resistance is a huge problem, and I think that antibiotics are one of the most important discoveries of mankind. Um, before antibiotics were discovered, even like a minor injury like a scrap or a wound can be life-threatening. For example, before antibiotics were discovered, one out of 10 uh, skin injuries uh, could result in loss of a limb or even could be life-threatening. In fact, uh, most of the death during World War I was due to many of the, uh, was due to infections uh, occurring due to stabs or wound injuries. So now, uh, due to rising resistance, we're sort of back to the era of the 18th century where these minor injuries can be life-threatening. For example, just in the US alone, uh, there are around 20,000 deaths occurring every year due to antibiotic resistant bacteria, and more than 2 million infections occur every year uh, due to these drug resistant pathogens. So, why did this happen? So, drug resistance is a pretty natural uh, phenomenon. Like every time a new antibiotic is introduced, uh, resistance naturally occurs. For example, this data from gonorrhea, but this applies for a lot of other diseases as well. For example, this shows the year in which an antibiotic was introduced. And this shows the year in which resistance was reported. You can see that for within a few years, for every single antibiotic, resistance strains have been reported. Oh. I think this is fine as long as we keep discovering new antibiotics, but that's not what has happened. So initially, then in the 40s and 50s, we've been we discovered a lot of antibiotics, and this plot shows uh, the year in which the antibiotics were approved by FDA, and you can see that. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we had a lot of new antibiotics that were being approved. But after that, we stopped sort of developing new antibiotics. So combined with this fact that, you know, within every few years, we're developing resistance to existing drugs, and the fact that we have very few antibiotics in the pipeline means that we have uh, no resort to go back to when we find resistance to many of these antibiotics. And, and recently, people have been discovering uh, multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant strains. For example, there's an E. coli strain discovered in Pennsylvania where that's resistant to the drug of last resort. So uh, so this is all the time where, you know, like 
there are hardly any antibiotics now to treat these infections. So uh, one way in which people are now trying to uh, solve this problem, uh, at least temporarily, is by using what's called combination of drugs. So the reason why people think combination therapy is really effective is that the probability of developing resistance to one antibiotic might be high, but then uh, you can imagine that statistically probability of de uh, developing resistance to multiple antibiotics should be much more lower. So by using, for example, combination of n antibiotics, you're reducing the probability to like one uh, exponentially. Another reason why people use combination of antibiotics is also to uh, enhance potency. So uh, for example, you can think of uh, different ca class of drugs targeting different sets of uh, pathogens. It could be that uh, certain class of drugs are very effective in slow growing pathogens, some are effective in fast growing ones. By combining uh, different drugs together, you're sort of enhancing the potency and reducing the treatment time. Uh, that the same thing applies for spectrum. You can target different types of pathogens. For example, if you don't know what the infection is, by giving combination of drugs, you can target both gram-negative pathogens and gram-positive ones. So there are different advantages of using combinations of drugs. But the challenge is that when you start looking at the combinations, the numbers are really uh, com complicated. For example, for designing just identifying an optimal four drug combination from a set of just 100 drugs would require you to screen through like around 4 million combinations. This is just for looking at potency, figuring what's the most potent among these drugs. And if you also want to look at the optimal dose, then the numbers goes uh, becomes even more higher. So uh, there are two main ways people usually do this. One is just by trial and error. They just randomly screen combinations of drugs. Another way is to do it more intuitively. If you know the underlying biochemical pathways, then you can be like, I know the drug A targets pathway one. And if you could figure out another drug that targets a parallel backup pathway, then you could imagine those two drugs would be very synergistic. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have such detailed maps for most organisms. And for most drugs, you don't even know what the actual targets are. So taking the systems approach uh, is a bit challenging right now. <coughs> so an another challenge is that even for many of these well studied antibiotics, new mechanisms are still being discovered. So for example, majority of existing antibiotics either target cell wall synthesis, like penicillins, uh, cephalosporins, and there are a lot of drugs target ribosome uh, translation. And there are a few that target DNA synthesis and some target RNA uh, synthesis. But then even recently, there have been papers that report new mechanisms of action for even these well-studied penicillins. Like one controversial new theory is that uh, penicillins also uh, um, produce reactive oxygen species, and that contributes to uh, cell death as well. So even for these well-studied antibiotics, uh, people are discovering new mechanisms right now. So uh, what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk is a new uh, computational approach that sort of tries to solve this challenge of designing drug combinations. Uh, uh, this approach called Indigo uses chemogenomics data and uses that to identify the most effective uh, synergistic drug combinations. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we can apply the same approach for a uh, lot of pathogens that are, lack uh, detailed uh, genomics data, like uh, tuberculosis, Tafaris, Isotobacter, by using data from E. coli. So what is chemogenomics? So uh, in a typical chemogenomics screen, what uh, scientists do is that they expose a drug of interest uh, against different gene deletion strains of, of a pathogen. For example, uh, for E. coli, we have a lot of single gene deletion uh, collections. So you can expose those collection of strains uh, to an antibiotic. So you can imagine two things might happen. One is that knocking off a gene might enhance the sensitivity to an antibiotic, or it could confer resistance to an antibiotic. Uh, for example, if as, uh, a gene encodes a certain uh, transporter that is involved in taking up the antibiotic, then knocking that off would confer resistance to that drug. Whereas if that gene is in, uh, encodes an enzyme that uh, uh, produces a parallel pathway for survival of the antibiotic, then knocking that off would create more sensitivity to the antibiotic. So by looking at this pattern of gene sensitivity and resistance, you can sort of understand what the mechanism of action of a drug is. Even if it's an unknown uh, drug with unknown mechanism of action, you can still get some insights on what its target process is, how it's entering the cell, and how it's being exported out of the cell. Won't, so, you, won't you miss essential genes with this kind of screen? Oh, yeah, definitely. So uh, to address that, we are using uh, either like down-regulated essential genes or overexpressed 
genes, but yeah, that is one limitation that majority of the essential genes would be missed. <coughs> so uh, using this now you can get sort of like a barcode of sensitivities for uh, for a drug. For example, if a drug targets ribosome synthesis, you might imagine that genes in that pathway might uh, and either confer sensitivity or resistance to a to that drug. By doing this for hundreds of drugs, you can create like uh, individual barcodes for each compound that sort of hinted what its underlying mechanism is, the underlying uh, mechanism behind its transport and its efflux. What is each column? Uh -huh. so, so for example, uh, each one is a compound and this is a gene. And you can imagine that genes that confer sensitivity or resistance, you'd call that a call that a chemical genetic interaction or drug gene interaction. So you can then create like a big barcode for each drug. So, so the oral idea behind Indigo is that we would take these uh, drug gene interaction profiles that we uh, identify from chemogenic profiling and then use that to say something about how drugs interact. So for example, uh, you can imagine if two drugs target complementary processes, they might be synergistic. Or there is also a dominant theory right now that says that similarity is synergy. That means two drugs target similar processes can be synergistic, but now with this data driven framework you can test different hypotheses on what class of drugs are synergistic, what are antagonistic. So these are the inputs to Indigo. So uh, I talked to, told you about the chemogenomic profiles uh, for each compound and then it also uses known drug-drug interactions uh, as input. For example, we'll, uh, I'm going to talk about new experiments that we did and you can also compile data from literature on how, uh, what the interaction outcomes are between multiple antibiotics. And then we think using these two as input, what Indigo does is that it uh, identifies genes in the chemogenomic profiles that are most predictive of uh, drug synergy and antagonism. So by looking at hundreds of drug interactions and chemogenomic profiles, you can identify genes that are most likely conferring uh, predictive of synergy or antagonism. So then we will test this by you know generating new data of uh, novel drug combinations and then see if this framework works or not. Uh, just to simplify that, like, so what I think the Indigo works is sort of how the movie prediction in Netflix works. So in Netflix, uh, the algorithm takes in two inputs. One is the list of movies or TV shows that you've watched in the past. And it also has an underlying information about each movie or TV show, whether it's romance or comedy. So using those two information, we can now predict new, new movies or TV shows for you. Similarly, Indigo uh, takes in known drug-drug interaction, which is like known movies that you've watched and then takes into account some known information about each drug, which is like known information about each movie. And using that, it uh, predicts new combinations. So I, so far I talked about how to predict drug interactions. I'm just gonna briefly talk about how we actually experimentally measure them. So I think everyone has a sort of idea of what synergy means or what antagonism means. But for making predictions, we want to really quantify uh, the extent of synergy or extent of antagonism uh, between different combinations. So here's a simple thought experiment. So let's say you have E. coli cells and they're growing without any drug at one unit. And let's say you add drug one and the growth reduces to 0 0.8. And let's say you add another different drug and with that drug, the growth reduces to 0 0.5. So now what is the expectation that when you combine drugs one and two? So you need that null model to figure out if two drugs are synergistic or antagonistic. So in this case, if you assume that two drugs are independent, then your null expectation is that when you combine drug one and two, uh, the predicted growth rate should be uh, the product of these two values, which is 0 0.4. So now if you do an experiment and then you find that the actual growth rate is higher, then you can say that it's lower than my expectation. So it's these two drugs are antagonist. And similarly, if it's uh, growing at a much slower rate, then you can say that these two drugs are synergistic and you can also come up with a quantitative score uh, for this synergy compared to this null, null model. So there are two issues with this uh, framework. One is that uh, I'm just treating drug one as like a static entity, but you can imagine if I had a higher dose of drug one, the growth might go down even more. Similarly, a higher dose of drug two might lead to higher killing. So then you, uh, we might get different scores at different doses. Another issue is that imagine that if drug two is actually drug one, and then this is just drug one at a higher dose, then this model would predict that drug one is synergistic with itself, which is not, uh, which is not possible. So to avoid that, we actually do experiments where we look at multiple doses of each drug. So this is a model that you're going to be using for the rest of the talk. It's called the low-visor activity model, where 
we screen at multiple dose combinations of drug A and B and we define each drug as not interacting with itself. So let's say I have drug A here and drug A here and then I use different doses of the same <coughs> drug then in the diagonals the cells uh, which are growing in this eye will be exposed to the same quantity of the drug. For example, you should see that same amount of killing happens uh, at 4 units of drug everywhere. So just by looking at this uh, figure I can tell you whether two drugs are uh, synergistic or antagonist. So for example, if it's the same drug you should see a linear straight line. That means that these two drugs are not interacting. But if you see a conca uh, concave curve you know that they are synergistic. Which means that for example, let's say I get complete uh, growth inhibition at 4 units. But then when I add a little bit of drug B, I get even more killing. And imagine that if all cells are dead at uh, 3 units. That means you are getting a synergistic response. Where with this lower amount of drug, you are still getting the same amount of growth inhibition. So by looking at the line of constant growth, we can tell if two drugs are synergistic or not. And by figuring out the concavity or convexity of this uh, uh, data, I can tell you how how what the extent of synergy or antagonism is. So we then uh, experimentally measured uh, to train Indigo we measured interactions for 15 different antibiotics. We chose this because uh, they have different mechanisms of action. So we chose like protein synthesis inhibitors, uh, DNA synthesis inhibitors, uh, drugs that target cell wall and we tried to uh, figure what the interaction outcomes are. So as I mentioned before if something is concave it's synergistic like here it's in blue things are convex that means they are antagonistic, rest are neutral and on track. Uh, one thing you can see right uh, here just from the looking at this figure is that there is lot more red that means there is lot more antagonism than synergy. So if you just randomly combine two different antibiotics uh, you will most likely see antagonism that means they actually interfere with each other's action and you get a suboptimal response. Synergy is actually quite rare and you probably have to do an exhaustive screen to figure out which antibiotics are synergistic. Another interesting trend you might see here is that the drugs actually are clustered and, uh, uh, and you can see that drugs with similar mechanism of action seem to cluster together although it's not consistent everywhere but you can see <coughs> DNA synthesis inhibitors are clustered, uh, ribosome inhibitors are clustered here. So there seems to be some uh, relationship between the mechanism of action and the way they interact. Uh, but it's not true that drugs that have similar mechanism of action are synergistic with each other. For example, you can see that DNA synthesis inhibitors are not really synergistic. Some are neutral, some are antagonistic, some seem to be synergistic. So drugs with similar mechanism do not have to be synergistic. So with this uh, data as input, we then uh, use chemogenomic profiles for these antibiotics uh, from this study, Nichols et al. that measured uh, chemogenomic profiles for some new drugs and more than 50 HTS agents. So using these two as input, we then made predictions for all the profiles that are present in this data set. So that's around 50,000 combinations. So we then want to test Indigo uh, for, for novel drug combinations to see how accurate our predictions are. So among these 50,000 uh, uh, interactions that we made, we uh, tested four new antibiotics uh, that had a distinct mechanism of action than those in our training set. So we chose rifampicin which targets RNA synthesis. We didn't have any RNA synthesis inhibitors in our training data. Similarly, vancomycin targets cell wall synthesis, but it does so in a very different way than the ones that are in the training data. So then this will help us test, really test the push the limits of our algorithm. If you have drugs with new mechanism, will this algorithm uh, predict uh, interaction outcomes accurately? So we then experimentally measured interactions of these antibiotics uh, with the drugs in our training set. And so this is on 66 different uh, interactions. And what we found was that uh, Majority of the indigo predictions were uh, uh, matched with experiments. Uh, 7 out of 10 top 10 synergistic predictions were also synergistic experimentally. Similarly, 7 out of 10 antagonistic predictions were also antagonistic experimentally. Overall, there was a very good consistency between what the algorithm predicted and what we observed uh, in experiments. Uh, so it's not perfect, uh, but we do see like a very strong concordance between these two uh, predictions. So later on I will talk about uh, what were the incorrect predictions and why uh, that happened. But another thing to note is that these were drugs with new mechanism of action. But if you had drugs with similar mechanisms we found that you could get much higher uh, accuracy. So these are pairwise combinations. We recently also expanded it to make three way predictions. 
So combination of three different antibiotics and we measured what the outcomes were. Uh, once again, just like the paroids combinations, you can see that there's a lot more red in this data set than green. So once again, even if you go higher order, there's a lot more chance that you'll find antagonism uh, than synergy. So this is experimental data. And we uh, once again chose new drugs that were not part of the training set, like ampicillin, azithromycin, minocycline, and pampin. Uh, that were not part of the original training, set, uh, training data. And then we made predictions for these. Once again, just like the pairwise case, we found very good concordance between the experimental data and the model predictions. So we then went back and looked at the entire 50,000 interactions that we predicted uh, using the Nicole's data set. And we wanted to see if uh, combinations that are being used clinically were also being predicted to be synergistic or antagonistic. And that's exactly what we found. Like many of the clinically used antibiotic combinations were predicted to be uh, synergistic by Indigo. For example, combinations of ampicillin and gentamicin, which are commonly used for treating uh, gut infections, uh, was predicted, correctly predicted to be uh, synergistic by indigo. Another interesting thing to note is that uh, indigo also correctly predicted antagonism between bacterial static and bactericidal drugs. So bactericidal drugs are those that actively kill the pathogen, whereas bacterial static drugs only stop its growth. And it's clinically known that these two drugs usually are avoided in the clinic because they're antagonistic with each other. And that Indigo correctly predicted antagonism between these two classes. And we also group drugs based on uh, their mechanism, just to see if there are certain class of antibiotics that are commonly synergistic or they are commonly antagonistic. And what we found was that, uh, when, well, the patterns are pretty complex. There was one class that seems to be highly synergistic with almost every other drug class. That's what's shown here. So these are drugs that disrupt the proton motive force. And the proton motive force is needed for active uptake of many antibiotics. And so drugs that impact the proton motive force seems to either enhance the uptake of other drugs, they'll be making them more uh, synergistic. <coughs> so, so far I told you that it works well, but now I want to know how it actually works. Like what are the genes, or how is it actually predicting certain drugs to be synergistic or antagonistic? So we can understand the mechanism behind how these antibiotics work. So we focus on the uh, genes that are being used uh, by the indigo model to make these predictions. So even though the chemogenomic profiles have like around 4,000 genes in them, uh, indigo seemed to have used only 250 genes, and that was sufficient to uh, uh, recapture majority of its predictive ability, which was really surprising. So we want to know what these 250 genes were and what pathways were involved in those genes. And what we found was that, uh, as expected, many of the pathways that were uh, used by Indigo to make these predictions are known targets of these antibiotics, like cell wall synthesis, DNA replication, ribosome, uh, et cetera. But we also surprisingly found many metabolic pathways. So none of these antibiotics that I showed you targets metabolism. But then we saw many metabolic pathways like oxidative phosphorylation, pentose phosphate pathway, amino acid synthesis. This was really surprising. And some of them are also correlated with uh, drug synergy and antagonism. So what he found was that many of the metabolic pathways are needed for active uptake of antibiotics. So most antibiotics don't directly diffuse into the cell. There are transporters that take up these antibiotics and uh, in, inside the pathogen, and that requires energy. And so most of them are powered by uh, redox uh, factors, and uh, oxidative phosphorylation pathway and others might be providing this redox energy for taking up these antibiotics. Another reason why these are showing up could be that there's a new theory that says that uh, many of these antibiotics cause cell death by producing reactive oxygen species. And so oxidative phosphorylation is one of the major producers of uh, reactive oxygen species. And maybe that's why it's being predicted to be a top pathway for uh, breaking drug interaction. So, so far I told you about how the algorithm works and what pathways it's using to predict uh, drug synergy and antagonism. The next I wanted to focus on uh, <coughs> the drugs or interactions that we are consistently making wrong predictions on and try to see if we can improve our model. So if we go back to our top predictions, we found that there were few antibiotics such as pectinomycin that consistently resulted in wrong predictions. So you want to know why, what was special about these antibiotics that's making, uh, that's causing errors in indigo. So in the chemogenomics data, like it tells us about the mechanism of action and mechanism of uptake but it doesn't really capture the physical properties of the antibiotic. 
So for example, there are some drugs that can that are very hydrophobic that can actually diffuse through the membrane. But for many others, they need active proteins or channels to, to be taken up inside the cell. So we wondered if uh, the chemical properties of the drugs can give us some insights on why we are making these wrong predictions. So we looked at various chemical properties. Uh, and what we found was that uh, specifically the molecular weight and the hydrophobicity, uh, measured with solubility, were the two top uh, uh, properties that were correlating with incorrect predictions. So you can see these plots uh, C and D here that uh, drugs with very low molecular weight were resulting in large errors in our model. Similarly, drugs that were very hydrophobic were also causing a lot of errors. So if the drug has very low molecular weight, it probably just diffuses directly in and maybe it doesn't require any active transport uh, into, the, into the cell. So probably that's why we are making uh, errors for drugs with small molecular weight uh, or with, uh, that are very hydro hydrophobic. Another reason why we might be making these errors is that hydrophobic drugs might be having a lot of promiscuous interactions. They might be binding to a lot of proteins and they might have a lot of side interactions apart from the direct target. So uh, we haven't incorporated these properties yet, but that's the next step in our models to combine both chemogenomics data and uh, drug chemical properties to further uh, improve our predictions. So just to summarize what I've said so far for the first part of the talk, uh, I briefly described how Indigo works. It uses chemogenomics data to predict uh, drug synergy and antagonism, and we identify like chemical properties that can uh, lead to more errors in our model. And then uh, also I showed about what uh, metabolic pathways that might be predictive of drug interact. So, so far I've done this in E. coli, but what about, uh, when most of the treatments are needed for uh, pathogens like tuberculosis or staph aureus where we have very little uh, chemogenomics data. So the next part I'm going to talk about how we can apply this same idea to uh, these different pathogens. So, so here's the idea. So we found that only 250 genes are sufficient, you know, recapture 75 or 80 percent of the model's accuracy. And what we found was the majority of these genes were highly conserved. Like can, most of the metabolic pathways are conserved across different species. And so we want to know if we can use the same approach using data from E. coli <coughs> to another organism that's slightly related. So to test this, uh, we want to apply this to a gram positive organism, Staph aureus. So E. coli is gram negative. Staph aureus is like really different from E. coli. And we want to know if we can use this gene-based model uh, and take this E. coli indigo model and then identify orthologous genes between E. coli and Staph aureus and then use the same indigo model to make predictions of Staph aureus. So for example, let's say uh, that uh, we find that majority of the genes are conserved between E. coli and Staph aureus. That means the same set of genes that are predictive for synergy or antagonism should be predictive for uh, synergy of antagonism in Staph aureus too. But for example, uh, if you find that gene 3 is not present in Staph aureus, then that would mean that the drugs, drug interactions that depend on gene 3 might not be conserved between the species. Whereas drug interactions that depend on gene 1 and 2, which are highly conserved, would still be conserved in different organisms. So people have so far not looked at conservation of drug interactions between species. So this will be a great way to compare the conservation and explain the mechanism behind how these two, uh, how the drug interactions are conserved between species. To do this, we uh, identified genes that are orthologous between E. coli and Staph aureus. And what we found was that even though there weren't that many genes that are shared, among the top 250 uh, predictive genes, we found that they were highly enriched for orthologs. So that means that uh, we can roughly expect the drug interactions to be conserved between E. coli and Staph aureus. So we then compared the two genomes, identified the orthologs, and then we overlaid these orthologs onto the E. coli indigo model. So once again, the idea is that drug interactions that depend on conserved genes, shown in green here, would be conserved between E. coli and Staph aureus. And drug interactions that depend on genes that are not conserved are most likely to be variable. So just by using data from E. coli, we can roughly guess which drug interactions will be conserved uh, in Staph aureus. So to test this, we experimentally measured uh, drug interactions uh, in Staph aureus. So we chose uh, from 10 antibiotics, and then we measured drug synergy and antagonism between them. So once again, just like in E. coli, you can see there's a lot more red than blue. That means if, uh, any two antibiotics that are randomly chosen 
are more likely to be antagonistic than uh, synergistic. And then we compared indigo predictions using the approach that I just mentioned and uh, with the experimental data that's here. And what we found that was that once again, uh, just like in E. coli, the predictions of synergy by indigo were also experimentally found to be synergistic. And the ones that are antagonistic were also experimentally found to be antagonistic. So the correlation is not as high as E. coli, but we're getting this data for free. Like we're using data from chemogenomics data from E. coli, drug interaction data from E. coli, but then we are making predictions for Staph aureus, and we are finding highly conserved drug-drug uh, interaction. So since we chose the same antibiotics in E. coli, we can then look at the experimental data in E. coli and see how uh, that compares with Staph aureus. What we found was that there is a mild correlation, uh, 0.39, between experimental drug interaction scores in Staph aureus and experimental drug interaction scores in E. coli. But there are a lot of drugs that are synergistic uh, in uh, Staph aureus but are highly antagonistic in E. coli and vice versa. So it's not... Uh, drug interactions are highly conserved between the two species. Whereas indigo is able to accurately predict um, these drug combinations that are changing between them. So this plot shows the predicted difference by indigo and the measured difference between the two species. And you can see that the drug combinations that show the greatest change are also predicted by indigo to show the greatest change um, between the two species. So just by looking at the conservation of the drug interaction predictive genes, we can say which combinations would be conserved and which ones would change. Uh, between the two species. What is measured difference? Measured, that's a, a measured difference in interaction scores. So for four minus three, right? So you'll get the, if it's synergistic, you'll get a score and for E. coli and anti, and for Staph aureus. If it's zero, that means they're essentially the same. If it's positive, that means it's different. It's more antagonistic in one than the other. So we want to try the same approach in a different organism. Uh, so this time we tested this in M tuberculosis. Uh, so one main reason we chose M tuberculosis is that clinically this uh, disease is being uh, treated with combinations of antibiotics. So it's, and there's rising resistance for this infection. And so by looking at uh, identifying combinations in this organism, we can actually you know, apply it clinically down the line. So uh, in this case, we didn't actually do experiments, we compiled data from literature on known drug interactions. And we tried to see if we can use the same approach to predict drug-drug interactions in uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And just like the previous case in Staph aureus, we were able to find, accurately predict drug interactions that are synergistic, uh, shown here, the ones that are antagonistic, uh, with very good accuracy. And so, and in this case, we didn't even have any equal data to compare with. And so, uh, just even once again, we're using data from E. coli, we are able to predict drug interaction outcomes uh, in, in the pathogen M. tuberculosis. So recently we started collaborating with experimentalists uh, who work on this pathogen and we have been testing new combinations. And so we've been looking at uh, the entire space of uh, drug interactions, looking at both combinations of two drugs and three drugs uh, in tuberculosis. And so I, I previously talked about 50,000 drug interactions um, between 70 different antibiotics. We looked at all uh, three-way combinations as well, which comes to a few million. And the goal was to see if we can identify really synergistic drug uh, antibiotic combinations that are better than the current clinically used combinations for treating tuberculosis. So you can see that currently used clinical combinations are not antagonistic, but they're not super synergistic either. So our goal was to you know, use our algorithm to figure out if there are drug combinations that are significantly better than the ones that are being used clinically right now. And so we did find a few that are significantly better. And then we uh, collaborated with uh, Sherman Lab uh, in C uh, UW Seattle to test these uh, promising predictions. I'm showing one such thing here uh, is a combination of spectinomycin and chlorpromazine, which indigo predicted to be highly synergistic. And in fact, it was highly synergistic. So this uh, shows the ex experimental data where in green means that there's high growth of the pathogen, red means there's a complete inhibition of the pathogen. And you can see that spectinomycin alone uh, requires almost 2x dose to completely kill the pathogen. Uh, whereas when I add just 1 16th of the second drug, even 1 16th of the first drug is enough to come entirely kill the pathogen. So we're able to reduce the dose 16 fold uh, uh, by uh, 
we are identifying the most synergistic combination using Indigo. We also found other ones that are better than the uh, clinically used ones, which are also testing. We also uh, found some few antagonistic ones uh, that are used in the clinic, which should be avoided. So just some are, uh, this is clinical uh, data. This is this is experimental lab data, yeah, for in culture. So the next step is obviously tested in mice. Yeah. So just to summarize what I've said so far, uh, initially talked about how we can use Indigo to make predictions in E. coli, but with uh, mapping orthologs, we can roughly estimate what the interaction outcomes are going to be uh, in various organisms for which we have no data right now. And we showed you how we can, using this approach, you can predict interaction outcomes for Staph aureus and uh, M. tuberculosis. So one final thing I want to uh, talk about, uh, third part of my talk, uh, is the role of uh, pathogen metabolism. So, so far I've just been talking about as if the drug interactions are fixed for an organism. When I say drug A plus is synergistic, most of the experiments are done on actively dividing cells. But it is clinically known that, for example, uh, drug sensitivity changes for slow growing cells for this actively dividing cells. So, cells in biofilms are show very different sensitivity than those that are in, the, in lab or culture. So, I want to know what the impact of metabolism would be on a drug interaction. So there are a few provocative studies that have come out recently that shows the importance of metabolism on uh, sensory antibiotics. So for example, in this study, what uh, people found was that cells that are resistant to the drug canamycin uh, can be resensitized by just adding two metabolites, alanine and glucose. So these are not drugs. These are just uh, metabolites that are normally consumed by the bacteria. But by adding these two metabolites to the media, the cell that was resistant to this drug is now be has become sensitive to it. So this is really striking. Uh, the reason the mechanism they found out how this happens is that alanine and glucose turn on the TCA cycle, and the TCA cycle's activity is needed for the proton motive force that I mentioned even for earlier. That's required for the active uptake of this antibiotic. So the metabolic state seems to actively influence sensitivity to different drugs. Similarly, this applies even in vivo. Uh, there are different metabolic environments in vivo depending on the tissue in which the pathogen is in. Another study found that the metabolic environment, the metabolites that are present in the environment can actively either protect a uh, pathogen from an antibiotic or enhance its sensitivity. And in fact, it's even more, more complex than that. Sometimes when you treat antibiotics, they uh, also influence the metabolism of the local host cells, which then change the local metabolic environment, which can then protect pathogens from uh, uh, antibiotics. So, Taking into account the metabolic environment and the metabolism of pathogen is important uh, for designing better therapies. So the oral picture right now is that traditionally people just thought antibiotics hit an important target and that causes cell death. But in fact, uh, you also need to take into account the metabolic state of the pathogen and if it's stressed or not. And all these factors together influence the sensitivity of a pathogen to an antibiotic. So moving forward, I want to take into account how metabolism influences uh, the cell death resistance by different pathogens. So to this, we first, so far I've just showed data on single antibiotics. We want to experimentally measure uh, in, our, in our own hands to see uh, if metabolic state actually influences sensitivity of both drugs and drug combinations. So we did this in E. coli again, and the, what this data is showing is synergy and antagonism in two different metabolic conditions. One is a normal LB rich media in which almost all experiments are done. And then we change the media condition which the bacteria is growing. Instead of rich media, we grew cells in glucose minimal media. Uh, they are still actively dividing. It's just their metabolism is slightly different. Uh, but strikingly, what we found was that uh, the synergy and antagonism of different drugs change dramatically between these two conditions. There are a lot of combinations that are shown in uh, red here or here. That means they're antagonistic, become synergistic in glucose media. In fact, there are a lot more synergy in glucose manual media than uh, in LB. This is really striking. So it's the same drugs. They're targeting like cell wall synthesis, or ribosome uh, translation, but the metabolic state seems to completely uh, uh, change the interaction outcome between uh, different classes. So we want to know now, uh, and there's very little correlation between the drug interaction scores in rich media compared to minimal media. So what this means is that when you want to predict these drug interactions, you also need to take into account the metabolic state or metabolic environment of the pathogen. Uh, 
So this also complicates uh, the design of synergistic combinations because I told you there's a huge space of combinations, but you also have to take into account a third dimension, which is the metabolic condition. So to do this, we uh, uh, expanded Indigo uh, called Indigo Plus, which is uh, still in preparation. So in addition to uh, take into account known drug-drug interactions and drug-gene interactions, Indigo also takes into account the chemogenomic profiles of individual metabolic perturbation. So previously I told you how Indigo predicts drug interactions for different drug pairs. Now we're going to make it context specific. So every time Indigo says something is synergistic, it will also tell you what the metabolic condition is. So now drug A and B could be synergistic in glucose media, but they could be antagonistic in a different media condition. So to do this, uh, just like drugs that have chemical genetic interactions, we can also uh, identify genetic interactions or metabolic conditions. So in this case, what this means is that uh, for growth in glucose, uh, cells need either certain genes to metabolize glucose to produce energy, and by knocking off those genes, you would confer sensitivity to growth in glucose. So once again, you can define a drug gene in interaction uh, like we did for drugs for um, uh, metabolic conditions. So these are, uh, glucose is not a drug, it's a metabolite, so it, it doesn't really inhibit cells growth but we can identify genes that are important for its metabolism. So using this data, I'm, I'm just going to directly jump to the results here. So we use this data and we trained on this experimental data set that I showed you before across metabolic conditions. So now using Indigo, you're going to make predictions of drug interactions in multiple metabolic environments. So we looked at eight different metabolic environments for which we had uh, these uh, chemogenomics data. And, we, and what this plot shows is the predicted drug interaction score sort of for 700 different antibiotics in these media conditions. So one thing that you can see from here is that the whole plot is red in color. So all this data is uh, related to LB media and we didn't find a single synergistic interaction in this case. So almost every single metabolic condition sort of inhibits the drug sensitivity. So compared to LB media. So and among those I would say the ones that target cell wall synthesis seems to be the most uh, affected. They seem to be more antagonistic. So it's important to actually take into account these uh, metabolic conditions because they seem to inhibit drug action. So I'm just showing the really, it's the same data, I'm showing the really top antagonistic ones here. Once again, you can see that there's hardly any synergy, there's only antagonism uh, in different metabolic environments. So that was theory, that was the prediction by the model. So we then tested it experimentally. And so we chose one media condition because it's how to do these experiments. We tested predictions in glycerol media and we wanted to see if it was indeed the case that uh, for all the drugs there's actually antagonism or not synergy. And it was indeed true. And in fact, uh, what this plot shows is the log fold change in MIC between LB media and this glycerol condition. And for the ones that Indigo predicted to be antagonistic, they were indeed antagonistic. But in fact, they were antagonistic by like several log folds. For example, last year NAM was had a thousand fold reduction in sensitivity in uh, glycerol media. So, so Indigo predicted it qualitatively and in fact data was much more stronger than that. And this is the same plot showing this data in more as a bar, box plot. So that was single drugs. So we then went ahead and predicted outcomes for drug-drug combinations. And in this, in this case we found a lot more synergy. So this might suggest that you know putting drugs in combinations might be a better idea when you want to have effective sensitivity across metabolic environments. And in this case we found several more drug synergy and each metabolic condition seems to have a unique impact on drug interaction. Like anaerobic condition seems to have a lot more synergy, very few antagonism, but then conditions like glycerol and glucose had a lot more synergy and antagonism. So, so each metabolic condition uniquely changed the drug interaction outcome. So to test the drug-drug interactions, we experimentally measured uh, drug interaction outcomes for 10 antibiotics in uh, glycerol media. So the Indigo was trained on glucose media and LB and we made predictions for glycerol and then we compared uh, the experimental outcomes with predictions. And in this case you can see that uh, the ones predicted by Indigo to be synergistic were indeed synergistic and there was a very good correlation between predictions and experiments. And in contrast to uh, glucose or LB we can once again see there's a lot more synergy here uh, for drug-drug interaction. So how does this work? So 
Now, previously I showed that there are a lot of metabolic genes that seem to be important for uh, drug interaction prediction. So you once again went and looked at the top genes used by Indigo to predict these uh, drug interaction outcomes across metabolic environments. And this time what we found was that oxidative phosphorylation was like the really top pathway that was necessary for, uh, for this predictability. And we also saw many other metabolic pathways like purine metabolism, uh, glycine, serine, threonine metabolism, and they were all influencing uh, drug interaction outcomes. So I previously told you oxidative phosphorylation is needed for drug import, reactive oxygen species, but since you're also changing metabolic conditions like moving from rich media to glucose media, the activity of respiration plays an, of this pathway plays an important role for cells to uh, adjust to new metabolic conditions. So um, it's really uh, heartening to see these pathways being uh, stop predictors of drug interactions by indigo. So we also found uh, metabolic pathways that were correlating with synergy or antagonism. And so we found like glycolysis, uh, TCA cycle were correlating, like presence of these pathways strongly correlated with synergy and pathways in galactose metabolism and glyoxylate pathway were strongly correlating with antagonism. So we want to know why that was the case. And so for TCA cycle, I think I've previously mentioned that the active TCA cycle produces redox factors like NADH, FADH, which power the proton motive force, which is needed for taking up antibiotics. So if a drug or uh, a drug induces this pathway, then that results in increased PCA cycle activity, which can result in taking up of more drugs or a second drug, which results in increased synergy. Uh, whereas the glyoxylate pathway, in fact, is a bypass pathway uh, that prevents the activity of TCA cycle. So if a drug induces a glyoxylate pathway, there's no, not much production of NADH, and so there's no change in proton motor force, and so there's no active uptake of drugs, and so the bacteria can be tolerant to, uh, to an antibiotic. So you really need active metabolism to uh, uh, take up these drugs. And uh, pathways that bypass these can be potentially to antibiotics. So just like in previous case, we want to know if this uh, observations apply across uh, different pathogens. So now in this case, we tested it in a pathogen called Acinetobacter baumani. It's also one of the most, uh, I would say, top drug resistant pathogens uh, in the US and is responsible for more than close to 10% of all uh, hospital born drug, uh, drug resistant infections. So you want to apply the same idea that we applied earlier for Staph aureus uh, to this pathogen. So you once again took the E. coli indigo model, found orthologs between E. coli and Acinetobacter, and then we used this model to make predictions of drug synergy and antagonism. So once again, the idea is that if drug interactions are uh, predicted to use conserved genes, then it will also be conserved in uh, Acinetobacter. If it's using genes that are not conserved, then it will more likely change uh, between the two species. Uh, so another surprising thing was that the among the top predictive genes identified by Indigo, around 50% were conserved uh, in Acinetobacter. Uh, the ones that were conserved were uh, metabolic pathways. The ones that were not conserved were cell wall synthesis and mismatch repair pathway. So what this tells us is that uh, it is highly likely that the drug interactions between metabolic conditions would be conserved as the metabolic pathways are conserved between the two species. But maybe drugs that target cell wall synthesis or DNA replication uh, might show variable interactions uh, between the two species. So to test this, we uh, once again made predictions just like for E. coli for some of the different drugs across the eight metabolic conditions. And in this case, you can see that the data is a lot more boring sort of. There's no, there's no synergy, but there's not much antagonism either. So it, it seems to be like uh, 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 for, for this bacteria, acinetobacter, and metabolic conditions don't really impede uh, drug sensitivity across metabolic conditions. Whereas for E. coli, you can see there's a lot more antagonism uh, across conditions. And when we uh, did the experiments, what we found was that there's no big change in MIC of the antibiotics uh, between uh, in glucose, glycerol, or in LB media. And so this plot sort of shows the difference uh, between E. coli and Acinetobacter. So most of the uh, drugs were becoming slightly synergistic, but not much. That's because in and E. coli, they were highly antagonistic. And so they're moving towards uh, neutral in Acinetobacter. So that's single drugs. We also looked at drug combinations. And once again, you can see there's a lot more synergy with drug combinations than with uh, single drugs. 
uh, and this once again the pattern is pretty complex like each media condition seem to have its own unique pattern of synergy uh, uh, compared to others. Uh, so to test this now we chose a smaller subset of antibiotics uh, that we measured in E. coli and then we measured the drug interaction outcomes uh, in LB, minimal media in glucose and glycerol in, for acidobacter. So in this case once again you can see that each media condition this is experimental data and you can see that each condition has its own unique pattern of synergy. Uh, but just like the case in E. coli you can see that glucose media has a lot of synergy uh, uh, compared to LB. So when we are just looking at LB data we thought there is a lot of antagonism between antibiotics but then that reverses uh, in glucose minimal media. And we also found uh, drug combinations that were synergistic in all three media conditions. So negative scores uh, imply synergy here and you can see that certain combinations like amicacin and astreonam are synergistic across media conditions. So we think these might be really effective uh, treatments because they are they have strong potency across metabolic environments. So uh, once again uh, when you compare the predictions by indigo uh, to the experimental data we found a very strong correlation uh, across metabolic environments. This shows that using indigo using E. coli data we can still make predictions for a different pathogen. Uh, to summarize what I've said so far uh, I mentioned how the metabolic state of the pathogen or the metabolic environment can have a huge impact on drug sensitivity and told how we can uh, enhance indigo by developing a new method called indigo plus by taking account of the metabolic uh, chemogenomic profiles we are able to predict uh, the uh, potency of drug combinations in new metabolic conditions. And we also use the same idea of using orthology mapping to predict drug interactions in acinetobacter. And we also found <coughs> pathways that are top predictors of synergy and antagonism in different metabolic environments. So that I'll just quickly conclude. Uh, to summarize what I've uh, told you so far, I talked about a new method called Indigo using which you can predict drug synergy and antagonism using chemogenomics data. Uh, using Indigo viewers for the first time you're able to predict interaction outcomes in different organisms based on using data from E. coli. And this is also the first time, we, uh, this is the first approach for predicting the impact of metabolic conditions on drug interaction. So moving forward you are trying to see if we can apply um, the same approach to identify the interplay between immune stress and antibiotics to see if indigo can predict drugs are synergistic with the immune attack or not. And also understand more of the mechanism behind synergy and antagonism. So far you identified the pathways that are predictive but really want to manipulate these pathways and see if we can rationally change synergy between uh, uh, different drugs. With that I would like to conclude and <coughs> thank various funding sources, uh, our collaborators at uh, Harvard, at UW uh, and at Sabansk University and students in my lab. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Any questions? Yeah. Even the best um, drugs that are really pathogen specific are uh -huh. going to have um, side effects. <coughs> Uh -huh. Have you ever tried any of your synergistic combinations, thrown them on human cells? Oh, on human cells? Yeah. So most of the drugs we're using are sort of being used clinically, so we assume that they are clinically safe. But if it's a novel drug, then that's something we should yeah. definitely worth trying. It happens in oncology all the time when uh -huh. you try to combine drugs, you get new side effects that wouldn't uh -huh. have been predicted by either drug alone. Yeah, that is true. That's something that's I would, easy to do. That's true. We just, but I don't know how we would quantify it. Like, we are trying to see if we can use a zebra fish model for the tuberculosis combinations to see if we can screen a lot of combinations in high throughput in zebra fish to see if there is side effects. But then I think doing it for the top one or two might be easier but then if you want to rank hundreds of them it might be more challenging. Right. So, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of these where you saw this almost synthetic lethality uh -huh. phenotype. You know, it's so dramatic it'd be uh -huh. nice to just but, know that that's not. So that's true, yeah. Just for the top one or two we could, yeah. yeah I think right. that's definitely uh, something we should uh, do, yeah. I think we're doing it in mouse and maybe that's the uh, next step. Yeah. Have you talked to Dr. Guan? She got first place in AstraZeneca drug uh -huh. energy challenge. Now that's that's for cancer, but yeah, uh -huh. maybe some similar principles can be applied. Yeah, definitely. I've been following that work, so trying to see if we can apply similar data. So far what you've found is that in terms of just raw correlation accuracy, our accuracy seems to be higher 
But I think it's bacteria versus cancer. Yeah, you this can't is apples lot and more, oranges. You can't always do that. Exactly. So I think that data is a lot more complex probably. And I think they're using transcriptomics data whereas you're using chemogenomics. Chemogenomics directly tells you what the target processes are, whereas in transcriptomics, it's a lot more variable. You just get a lot of secondary response. So I think the challenge there is a lot more harder uh, than in this case. But that's something I'm definitely following you. It's a very wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And I want to know where we can use this software. Is it freely available? Yep, yeah, I mean, so it, it's a MATLAB program that you can download from our website, but there's no web interface yet. Yeah. Uh, one more. Kernel genomics data, uh -huh. as for Nicole's data set, yep, yeah. which is around eight years ago. Uh -huh. So uh, if we are uh, looking for drugs that are not used in the Nicole's data set, uh -huh. how easy it is to renormalize the uh, barcode and incorporate this number? Huh. So uh, I would say there is a recent paper now that is it's called Registome Database. They've compiled all known chemogenomics data from Nichols and others. I think they have around, around 300 now. There's a lot more antibiotics than the Nichols data. So we are trying to remake predictions using the entire resistome database now. So I think it's, there's a lot more data than in the Nichols study. So I, I think there's not a big issue with normalization because you're mainly trying to identify genes that confer resistance or sensitivity. So I think those seem to be robust uh, across studies. Just curious, like when cells are grown in minimal media, mm -hmm. are they normally as healthy as the yeah. LG media? Are they like under stress or just general viability when in no drug condition? Uh -huh. And is that normally a factor you need to consider? I, mean, I think it would be a factor. I would I would say these cells are, cells are still growing. Like, you know, people still grow glu E. coli and glucose and it's its favorite carbon source, so it, it's not as stressed. Okay. But I would say there must be some change in metabolism that's happening, that's causing this cell sensitivity. Probably in glycerol media, it's growing a lot more slower, and that mm -hmm. probably impacts uh, drug sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I think the results are more dramatic for drug combinations because when you compare glucose and glycerol, the change in MIC is not that much, but then there's a big change in drug interaction outcomes. Okay. So there's probably a little bit of stress involved but it's also the underlying metabolism that's changing that's causing this. Oh, yeah. In yeast, where they've done all possible gene-gene knockouts uh -huh. um, and looked for synergies. They've actually seen that protein-protein interaction mm -hmm. data can help to predict um, the oh. synergies. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Is there protein-protein interaction map data for these organisms you know, that be used? So we don't have that much in E. coli. So another thing we're thinking is we have a lot of chemogenomics data in yeast, and we also have protein-body interaction data in yeast. So we're trying to see if we can put all those data together to build an indigo model for antifungal compounds. That would be something that we could do, but free. Surprisingly, yeast seems to be much more amenable for PPI data than E. coli. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because of the yeast 2 hybrid systems. And this is a string database. Almost mm -hmm. every E. coli protein has some there is still some, yeah, all right, yeah. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, but I'm from dermatology department, uh -huh. so we are also doing something similar to like the input, I would say, uh -huh. gene drug interactions. Uh -huh. So I'm just wondering uh, if uh, Indica could help us to know the drug drug interactions for the dermatology related drugs, like skin diseases. Caused by bacteria? Um, oh, it's caused by humans, isn't you need human data. So I don't know how much you can stretch the orthology <laughs> from E. coli to humans. But I, I haven't even tried across I mean I haven't even tried eukaryotes yet. So So right now we are trying to uh, re repurpose the mm -hmm. existing drugs. Huh. And we are also interested to know whether it will have some drug drug interactions. Ah, okay. In that case, it will lead to uh, adverse effects. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested in this software to know the drug drug interactions, like I mean, antagonism. We, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't tried it, but 
So what the shot like you could if you have human data like maybe as, as I said like people are trying to do this for cancer so it might work yeah I don't know that's the reason I asked like how we could use it <laughs> okay <laughs> a lot of human drug drug interaction mediated like liver and things too yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and you're not gonna you're not gonna model that in coli data exactly yeah the cytochrome p450 interactions and stuff. Yep. And glycosylases. Exactly, yeah. So there's a lot more in humans than yeah, things to worry about. All right, thank you. Cool.